We're gonna read about uh, dialectical and historical material. I, we'll just do the whole f thing. I think we're pretty decent dialectical materialism understanders, but a lot of people confuse dialectical and historical materialism. They're not the same thing. It's not the same. So during the, our talk today, we'll we'll make sure that we we hash that out. Here we go. Dialectical and historical materialism by Uncle Joe Stalin, written in September 1938. Dialectical materialism is the world outlook of the Marxist-Leninist party. It's called dialectical materialism because its approach to the phenomena of nature, its method of studying and apprehending them is uh, its conception of these phenomena, its theory, is materialistic. Historical materialism is the extension of the principles of dialectical materialism to the study of life, the study of social life, and application of the principles of dialectical materialism to the phenomena of the life of society, to the study of society, and of its history. When describing their dialectical method, Marx and Engels usually refer to Hegel as the philosopher who formulated the main features of dialectics. This, however, does not mean that the dialectics of Marx and Engels is identical with the dialectics of Hegel. As a matter of fact, Marx and Engels took from the Hegelian dialectics only its rational kernel, casting aside its Hegelian idealistic shell, and developed dialectics further so as to lend it a modern scientific form. My dialectic method, says Marx, is not only different from the Hegelian, but is its direct opposite. To Hegel, the process of thinking, which under the name of the idea, he even transforms into an independent subject, is the demiurgos, the creator of the real world, and the real world is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. With me, on the contrary, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by... I got lost. Because I got a cat now. Oh my god, this little good guy. Here it is. With me, on the contrary, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated into forms of thought. When describing their materialism, Marx and Engels usually refer to Feuerbach as the philosopher who restored materialism to its rights. This, however, does not mean that the materialism of Marx and Engels is identical with the Feuerbach's with Feuerbach's materialism. As a matter of fact, Marx and Engels took from Feuerbach's materialism its inner kernel, developed it into a scientific philosophical theory of materialism, and cast aside its idealistic and religious ethical encumbrances. We know that Feuerbach, although he was fundamentally a materialist, objected to the name materialism. Engels more than once declared that, in spite of the materialist foundation, Feuerbach remained bound by the traditional idealist fetters, and that the real idealism of Feuerbach becomes evident as soon as we come to this, as soon as we come to his philosophy of religion and ethics. Dialectics comes from the Greek dialego, to discourse, to debate. In ancient times, dialectics was the art of arriving at the truth by disclosing the contradictions in the argument of an opponent and overcoming these contradictions. There were philosophers in ancient times who believed that the discourse of contradictions in thought and the clash of opposite opinions was the best method of arriving at the truth. This dialectical method of thought, later extended to the phenomena of nature, developed into the dialectical method of apprehending nature, which regards the phenomena of nature as being in constant movement and undergoing constant change, and the development of nature 
as the result of the development of the contradictions in nature, as the result of the interaction of opposed forces in nature. In its essence, dialectics is the direct opposite of metaphysics. Number 1. The Marxist Dialectical Method the, principles of, the principal features of the Marxist dialectical method are as follows. A. Nature connected and determined. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectics does not regard nature as an accidental agglomeration of things, of phenomena, unconnected with, isolated from, and independent of each other, but as a connected and integral whole in which things, phenomena, are organically connected with, dependent on, and determined by each other. The dialectical method therefore holds that no phenomena in nature, no phenomenon in nature can be understood if taken by itself, isolated from surrounding phenomena, inasmuch as any phenomenon in any realm of nature may become meaningless to us if it is not considered in connection with the surrounding conditions, but divorced from them, and that, vice versa, any phenomenon can be understood and explained if considered in its inseparable connection with surrounding phenomena, as one conditioned by surrounding phenomena. b. Nature is a state of continuous motion and change. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectics holds that nature is not a state of rest and immobility, stagnation and immutability, but a state of continuous movement and change, of continuous renewal and development, where something is always arising and developing, and something always disintegrating and dying away. The dialectical method therefore requires that Phenomena should be considered not only from the standpoint of their interconnection and interdependence, but also from the standpoint of their movement, their change, their development, their coming into being and going out of being. The dialectical method regards as important primarily not that which at the given moment seems to be durable and yet is already beginning to die away, but that which is arising and developing, even though at the given moment it may appear not, uh, to be not durable, for the dialectical method considers invincible only that which is arising and developing. All nature, says Engels, from the smallest thing to the biggest, from grains of sand to suns, from protista, or the primary living cells, to man, has its existence in eternal coming into being and going out of being, in a ceaseless flux, in unresting motion and change. Therefore, dialectics, Engels says, takes things and their perceptual, and their perceptual images essentially in their interconnection, in their con con concatenation, in their movement, in their rise and disappearance. C. Natural quantitative change leads to qualitative change. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectics does not regard the process of development as a simple process of growth where quantitative changes do not lead to qualitative changes but as a development which passes from insignificant and imperceptible quantita quantitative changes to open fundamental changes to qualitative changes. A development in which the qualitative changes n occur not gradually, but rapidly and abruptly, taking the form of a leap from one state to another. They occur not accidentally, but as the natural result of an accumulation of imperceptible and gradual quantitative changes. The dialectical method therefore holds that the process of development should be understood not as a movement in a circle, not as a simple repetition of what has already occurred,
but as an onward and upward movement, as a transition from old qualitative state to a new quali qualitative state, as a development from the simple to the complex, from the lower to the higher. Nature, says Engels, is the test of dialectics, and it must be said for modern natural science that it has furnished extremely rich and daily increasing materials for this test, and has thus proved that in the last analysis nature's process is dialectical and not metaphysical, that it does not move in an eternally uniform and constantly repeated circle, but passes through a real history. Here, prime mention should be made of Darwin, who dealt a severe blow to the metaphysical conception of nature by proving that the organic world of today, of plants and animals, and consequently man too, is all a product of a process of development that has been in progress for millions of years. Describing dialectical development as a transition from quantitative changes to qualitative changes, Engels says, In physics, every change is a passing of quantity into quality, as a result of a quantitative change of some form of movement either inherent in a body or imparted to it. For example, the temperature of water has at first no effect on its liquid state, but as the, te as the temperature of water rises or falls, a moment arrives when this state of cohesion changes and the water is converted in one case into steam and in the other into ice. A definite minimum current is required to make a platinum wire grow a glow. Every metal has its melting temperature. Every liquid has a definite freezing point and boiling point at a given pressure. As far as we are able, with the means at our disposal to attain the required temperatures. Finally, every gas has its critical point at which, by proper pressure and cooling, it can be converted into a liquid state. What are known as the constants of physics, or the point at which one state passes into another, are in the most cases nothing but designations for the nodal points at which a quantitative change, or increase or decrease of movement, causes a qualitative change in the state of the given body, and at which, consequently, quantity is transformed into quality. Passing to chemistry, Engels continues. Chemistry may be called the science of the qualitative changes which take place in the bodies as well as, uh, as the effect of changes of quantitative composition. His was already known to Hegel. Take oxygen. This was already known to Hegel. Take oxygen. If the molecule contains three atoms instead of the customary two, we get ozone, a body definitely distinct in odor and reaction from ordinary oxygen. And what shall we say of the different proportions in which oxygen combines with nit uh, nitrogen or sulfur, and each of which produces a body qualitative, uh, qualitatively different from all other bodies? Finally, criticizing Deering, who scolded Hegel for all he was worth, but surreptitiously borrowed from him the well-known thesis that the transition from the insentient world to the sentient world, from the kingdom of organic matter to the kingdom of organic life, is a leap to a new state. Engels says, Engels says, This is precisely the Hegelian nodal line of measure relations at wit, in which, at certain definite nodal points, the purely quantitative increase or decrease gives rise to a qualitative leap. For example, in the case of water which is heated or cooled, where boiling point and freezing point are the nodes at which, under normal pressure, the leap to a new aggregate state takes place and where consequently quantity is transformed into quality. D. Contradictions inherent in nature. Contrary to metaphysics, Dialectics holds that internal contradictions are inherent in all things and phenomena of nature, for they all have their negative and positive sides, a past and a future, 
something dying away and something developing, and that the struggle between these opposites, the struggle between the old and the new, between that which is dying away and that which is being born, between that which is disappearing and that which is developing, constitutes the internal content of the process of development, the internal content of the transformation of quantitative changes into qualitative changes. The dialectical method therefore holds that the process of development from the lower to the higher takes place not as a harmonious unfolding of phenomena, but as a disclosure of the contradictions inherent in things and phenomena, as a struggle of opposite tendencies which operate on the basis of these contradictions. In its proper meaning, Lenin says, dialectics is the study of the contradiction within the very essence of things. And further, development is the struggle of opposites. Such, in brief, are the principal features of the Marxist dialectical method. It is easy to understand how immensely important is the extension of the principles of the dialectical method to the study of social life and the history of society, and how immensely important is the application of these principles to the study of society and to the practical activities of the party of the proletariat. If there are no isolated phenomena in the world, if all phenomena are interconnected and interdependent, then it is clear that every social system and every social movement in history must be evaluated not from the standpoint of eternal justice or some other preconceived idea, as is not infrequently done by historians, but from the standpoint of the conditions which gave rise to that system or that social movement and with which they are connected. The slave system would be senseless, stupid, and unnatural under modern conditions. But under the conditions of a disintegrating primitive com or communal system, the slave system is a quite understandable and natural phenomenon, since it represents an advance on the primitive communal system. The demand for a bourgeois democratic republic, when Tsardom and bourgeois society existed, as let us say in Russia in 1905, was a quite understandable, proper, and revolutionary demand, for at that time a bourgeois republic would have meant a step forward. But now, under the conditions of the USSR, the demand for a bourgeois democratic republic would be senseless, would be a senseless and counter-revolutionary demand, for a bourgeois republic would be a retrograde step compared with the Soviet Republic. Everything, demand, everything depends on the conditions, time, and place. It is clear that, without a historical approach to social phenomena, the existence and development of the science of history is impossible, for only such an approach saves the, the science of history from becoming a jumble of accidents and an agglomeration of most absurd mistakes. Further, if the world is in a state of constant movement and development, if the dying away of the old and the upgrowth of the new is a law of development, then it is clear that there can be no immutable social systems, no eternal principles of private property and exploitation, no eternal ideas of the subjugation of the peasant to the landlord, of the worker to the capitalist. Hence, the capitalist system can be replaced by the socialist system, just as at one time the feudal system was replaced by the capitalist system. Hence, we must not base our orientation on the strata of society which are no longer developing, even though they at present constitute the predominant force, but on those strata which are developing and have a future before them, even though they at present do not constitute the predominant force. In the 80s of the past century, in the period of the struggle between the Marxists and the Narodniks, the proletariat in Russia constituted an insignificant minority of the population, whereas the individual peasants constituted the vast majority of the population. 
But the proletariat was developing as a class, whereas the peasantry as a class was disintegrating. And just because the proletariat was developing as a class, the Marxists based their orientation on the proletariat. And they were not mistaken. For as we know, the proletariat subsequently grew from an insignificant force into a first-rate historical and political force. Hence, in order to not err in policy, one must look forward, not backward. Further, if the passing of slow quantitative changes into rapid and abrupt qualitative changes is a law of development, then it is clear that revolutions made by oppressed classes are a quite natural and inevitable phenomenon. Hence, the tradition from capitalism to socialism. No, don't trust the liberals. They will betray you. Hence, the tradition from capitalism to socialism and the liberation of the working class from the yoke of capitalism cannot be affected by slow changes, by reforms, but only by a qualitative change of the capitalist system by revolution. Hence, in order to not err in policy, one must be a revolutionary, not a reformist. Further, if development proceeds by way of the disclosure of internal contradictions, by way of collisions between op opposite forces on the basis of these contradictions, and so as to overcome these contradictions, then it is clear that the class struggle of the proletariat is a quite natural and inevitable phenomenon. Hence, we must not cover up the contradictions of the capitalist system, but disclose and unravel them. We must not try to check the class struggle, but carry it to its conclusion. Hence, in order to not err in policy, one must pursue an uncompromising proletarian class policy, not a reformist policy of harmony of the interests of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, not a compromiser's policy of the growing of capitalism into socialism. Such is the dialectical method when applied to social life, to the history of society. As to Marxist philosophical materialism, is fundamentally the direct opposite of philosophical idealism. Two, Marxist philosophical materialism. The principal features of Marxist philosophical materialism are as follows. A. Materialist. Contrary to idealism, which regards the world as the embodiment of an absolute idea, a universal spirit, consciousness, Marxist philosophical materialism holds that the world is, by its very nature, material, that the multifold phenomena of the world constitute different forms of matter in motion, that interconnection and interdependence of phenomena, as established by the dialectical method, are a law of the development of moving matter, and that the world develops in accordance with the laws of movement of matter and stands in no need of a universal spirit. The materialist outlook on nature, says Engels, means no more than simply conceiving nature just as it exists, without any foreign admixture. Speaking of the materialist views of the ancient philosopher Hereticlus, who held that the world, the all-in-one, was not created by any god or any man, but was, is, and ever will be a living flame, systematically flaring up and systematically dying down. Lenin comments, a very good exposition of the rudiments of dialectical materialism. B. Objective reality. Contrary to idealism, which asserts that only our consciousness really exists, 
and that the material world, being, nature, exists only in our consciousness, in our sensations, ideas, and perceptions. The Marxist philosophical materialism holds that matter, nature, being, is an objective reality existing outside and independent of our consciousness. That matter is primary, since it is the source of sensations, ideas, consciousness, and that consciousness is secondary, derivative, since it is a reflection of matter, a reflection of being. That thought is a product of matter which in its development has reached a high degree of perfection, namely of the brain, and the brain is the organ of thought, and that therefore one cannot separate thought from matter without committing a grave error. Engels says, The question of the relation of thinking to being, the relation of spirit to nature, is the paramount question of the whole of philosophy. The answers which the philosophers gave to this question split them into two great camps. Those who asserted the primary of those who asserted the primacy of spirit to nature comprised the camp of idealism. The others who regarded nature as primary, belonged to the various schools of materialism. And further, the material, sensuously perceptible world to which we ourselves belong is the only reality. Our consciousness and thinking, however suprasensuous, however suprasensuous they may seem, are the product of a material, bodily organ, the brain. Matter is not a product of the mind, but mind itself is merely the highest product of matter. Concerning the question of matter and thought, Marx says, It's impossible to separate thought from matter that thinks. Matter is the subject of all changes. Describing Marxist philosophical materialism, Lenin says, Materialism in great... Re Materialism, in general, recognizes objectively real being, or matter, as independent of consciousness, sensation, experience. Consciousness is only the reflection of being, at best an approximately true, or, or adequate... I got lost. I got lost. I dropped my keyboard. We were having such a good time, too. was on a roll. Here. I was right about here. I know, Zoot. It's wild. Consciousness is only the reflection of being, at best, an approximately true or adequate or perfectly exact reflection of it. And further, matter is that which, up acting upon our sense organs, produces sensation. Matter is the objective reality given to us in sensation. Matter, nature, being the physical, is primary, and spirit, consciousness, sensation, the physical, is secondary. The world picture is a picture how matter moves. Oh, the psychical, the psychical. The physical is primary, the psychical is secondary. The world picture is a picture of how matter moves and how matter thinks. The brain is the organ of thought. And C. The world and its laws are knowable. Contrary to idealism, which denies the possibility of knowing the world and its laws, which does not believe in the authenticity of our knowledge, does not recognize objective truth, and holds that the world is full of things in themselves that can never be known to science, Marxist philosophical materialism holds that the world and its laws are fully knowable, that our knowledge of the laws of nature, tested by experiment and practice, is authentic knowledge, 
having the validity of objective truth, and that there are no things in the world which are unknowable, but only things which are as yet not known, but which will be disclosed and made known by the efforts of science and practice. Criticizing the thesis of Kant and other idealists and other idealists that the world is unknowable and that there are things in themselves which are unknowable and defending the well-known materialist thesis that our knowledge is authentic knowledge, Engels writes, The most telling ref refutation of this, as of all other philosophical crotchets, is practice namely experiment and industry. If we are able to prove the correctness of our conception of a natural process by making it ourselves, bringing it into being out of its conditions, and making it serve our own purposes into the bargain, then there is an end to the Kantian ungraspable, ungraspable thing in itself. The chemical substances produced in the bodies of plants and animals remained such things in themselves until organic chemistry began to produce them one after another, whereupon the thing in itself became a thing for us, as, for instance, alizarin, the coloring matter of the matter, which we no longer trouble to grow ill the matter roots in the field, but produce much more cheaply and simply from coal tar. For 300 years, the Copernican solar system was a hypothesis with a hundred, a thousand, or ten thousand chances to one in its favor, but still always a hypothesis. But when uh, Le Verrier, by means of the data provided by this system, not only deduced the necessity of this, uh, the necessity, I got lost, of the existence of an unknown planet, but also calculated the, the position in the heavens which this planet must necessarily occupy. And when Gal, Gala, uh, really found this planet, the Copernican system was proved. Gotta check out one thing here. Got some sort of message here. An issue was found. Why? What's the deal? Can't find the problem. Oh, man. All right. I don't know. What... Oh, no. Okay. Reading up. Accusing Bogdanov, Bazarov, Yushkev uh, Yushkevich, and the other followers of Mach of fide, uh, fideism, a reactionary theory which prefers faith to science, and defending the well-known materialist thesis that our scientific knowledge of the laws of nature is authentic knowledge and that the laws of science represent objective truth, Lenin says, Contemporary fideism does not at all reject science. All, of, all it rejects is the exaggerated claims of science to wit its claim to objective truth. If objective truth exists, as the materialists think, if natural science, reflecting the outer world in human experience, is alone capable of giving us objective truth, then all fideism is absolutely refuted. Such, in brief, are the characteristic features of the Marxist philosophical materialism. It's easy to understand how immensely important is the extension of the principles of philosophical materialism 
to the study of social life, of the study of, of the history of society, and how immensely important is the application of these principles to the history of society and to the practical activities of the party of the proletariat. If the connection between the phenomena of nature and their interdependence are laws of the development of nature, it follows, too, that the connection and interdependence of phenomena of social life are laws of the development of society, and not something accidental. Hence, social life, the history of society, ceases to be an agglomeration of accidents, for the history of society becomes a development of society according to regular laws, and the study of the history of society becomes a science. Hence, the practical activity of the party of the proletariat must not be based on the good wishes of outstanding individuals, not on the dictates of reason, universal morals, etc., but on the laws of development of society and on the study of these laws. Further, if the world is knowable and our knowledge of the laws of development of nature is authentic knowledge, having the validity of, of objective truth, it follows that social life, the development of society, is also knowable, and that the data of science regarding the laws of development of society are authentic data, having the validity of objective truths. Hence the, soci hence, the science of the history of society, despite all the complexity of the phenomena of social life, can be seen as precise as science as, let us say, biology, and capable of making use of the laws of development of society for practical purposes. Hence, the party of the proletariat should not guide itself in its practical activity by ca uh, casual motives, but by the laws of development of society and by practical deductions from these laws. Hence, socialism is converted from a dream of a better future for humanity into a science. Hence, the bond between science and practical activity, between theory and practice, their unity, should be the guiding star of the party of the proletariat. Further, if nature, being the material world, is primary, and consciousness, thought, is secondary, derivative, if the material world represents objective reality existing independently of the consciousness of men, while consciousness is a reflection of this objective reality, it follows that the material life of society, its being, is also primary, and its spiritual life secondary, derivative, and that the material life of society is an objective reality existing independently of the will of men, while the spiritual life of society is a reflection of this objective reality, a reflection of being. Hence, the source of formation of the spiritual life of society, the origin of social ideas, social theories, political views, and political institutions, should not be sought for in the ideas, theories, views, and political institutions themselves, but in the conditions of the material life of society, in social being, of which these ideas, theories, views, etc., are the reflection. Hence, if in different periods of the history of society, different social ideas, theories, views, and political institutions are to be observed, if under the slave system we encounter certain social ideas, theories, views, and political institutions, under feudalism others, and under capitalism others still, this is not to be explained by the nature, the properties of the ideas, theories, views, and political institutions themselves, but by the different conditions of the material life of society at different periods of social development. Whatever is the being of a society, whatever are the conditions of a material life of a society, such are the ideas, theories, political views, and political institutions of that society. In this connection, Marx says, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. 
Hence, in order to not err in policy, in order to not find itself in the position of idle dreamers, the party of the proletariat must not base its activities on abstract principles of human reason, but on the concrete conditions of the material life of society, as the determining force of social development, not on the good wishes of great men, but on the real needs of development of the material life of society. The fall of the utopians, including the, Nero the Nerodniks, anarchists, and social revolutionaries, socialist revolutionaries, was due, among other things, to the fact that they did not recognize the primary role which the conditions of the material life of society play in the development of society, and, sinking to idealism, did not base their practical activities on the needs of the development of the material life of society, but, independently of and in spite of these needs, on ideal plans and all-embracing projects, divorced from the real life of society. The strength and vitality of Marxism-Leninism lies in the fact that it does not base its practical activity on the needs of the development of the material life of society. It does base uh, and never divorces itself from the real life of society. It does not follow from Marx's words, however, that social ideas, theories, political views, and political institutions are of no significance in the life of society, that they do not reciprocally affect social being, the development of the material conditions of life of society. We've been speaking so far of the origin of social ideas, theories, views, and political institutions, of the way they arise, of the fact that the spiritual life of society is a reflection of the conditions of its material life. As regards the significance of social ideas, theories, views, and political institutions, as regards their role in history, historical materialism, far from denying them, stresses the important role and significance of these factors in the life of society in its history. There are different kinds of social ideas and theories. There are old ideas and theories which have outlived their day and which serve the interests of the moribund forces of society. Their significance lies in the fact that they hamper the development, the progress of society. Then there are new and advanced ideas and theories which serve the interests of the advanced forces of society. Their significance lies in the fact that they facilitate the development, the pro progress of society, and their significance is the greater the more uh, is the greater the more accurately they reflect the needs of development of the material life of society. New social ideas and theories arise only after the development of the material life of society has set new tasks before society. But once they have arisen, they become a most potent force which facilitates the carrying out of the new tasks set by the development of the material life of society. A force which facilitates the progress of society. It's precisely here that the tremendous organizing, mobilizing, and transforming value of new ideas, new theories, new political views, and new political institutions manifests itself. New social ideas and theories arise precisely because they are necessary to society, because it's impossible to carry out the urgent tasks of development of the material life of society without their organizing, mobilizing, and transforming action. Arising out of the new tasks set by the development of the material life of society, the new social ideas and theories force their way through, become the possession of the masses, mobilize and organize them against the moribund forces of society, and thus facilitate the overthrow of these forces, which hamper the development of the material life of society. Thus, social ideas, theories, and political institutions having arisen on the basis of the urgent tasks of the development of the material life of society, the development of social being, themselves then react upon social being, upon the material life of society, creating the conditions necessary for completely carrying out the urgent tasks of the material life of society and for rendering its further development possible. In this connection, Marx says, theory becomes a material force as soon as as it, as it has gripped the masses.
sense in order to be able to influence the conditions of material life of society and to accelerate their development and their improvement. The party of the proletariat must rely upon such a social theory, such a social idea as correctly reflects the needs of development of the material life of society, and which is, therefore, capable of setting into motion broad masses of people and of mobilizing them and organizing them into a great army of the proletarian party, prepared to smash the reactionary forces and to clear the way for the advanced forces of society. The fall of the economists and the Mensheviks was due, among other things, to the fact that they did not recognize the mobilizing, organizing, and transforming role of advanced theory, of advanced ideas, and, sinking to vulgar materialism, reduced the role of these factors almost to nothing, thus condemning the party to passivity and innation. In a nation. In a nation. In a nation. How do you say that word? In a nation. In a nation. The strength and fatality of, the Mar of Marxism-Leninism is derived from the fact that it relies upon an advanced theory which correctly reflects the needs of development of the material life of society, that it elevates theory to a proper level, and that it deems its that deems it its duty to utilize every ounce of the mobilizing, organizing, and transforming power of this theory. That is the answer historical materialism gives to the question of the relation between social being and social consciousness, between the conditions of development of material life and the development of the spiritual life of society. Takes us to number three. Historical materialism. Historical materialism. The extension of the principles of dialectical materialism to the study of social life and application of the principles of dialectical materialism to the phenomena of the life of society and to the study of society and of its history. In other words, historical materialism is the application of materialist dialectics and dialectical materialism to the study of human history. Materialism is foundational to Marxism-Leninism in two ways. Dialectical materialism is the ideological core of a scientific worldview. Historical materialism is a system of dialectical materialist opinions about the origin of, motivation of, and the most common rules that dominate the movement and development of human society. In other words, historical materialism, or histomat, is the application of diamat to the history of society, to the history of humankind. You got the philosophical basis, and then if you have you have the application of it. Before we do this, I'm gonna fill my water up and we're gonna continue. Historical materialism. It now remains to elucidate the following question. What from the viewpoint of historical materialism is meant by the conditions of material life of society? which in the final analysis determine the physiognomy of uh, physiognomy 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 which in the final analysis determine the physiognomy of society its ideas views political institutions etc what after all are these conditions of material life of society what are their distingu uh, distinguishing features there can be no doubt that the concept conditions of material life of society includes, first of all, nature, which surrounds society, geographical environment, which is one of the indispensable and constant conditions of material life of society, and which, of course, influences the development of society. What role does geographical environment play in the development of society? Is geographical environment the chief force determining the physiognomy of society? Rat. 
It's too damn high. The character of the social system of man? The transition from one system to another? Or isn't it? Historical materialism answers this question in the negative. Geographical environment is unquestionably one of the constant and indispensable conditions of development of society, of course, and of course, influences the development of society, accelerates or retards its development. But its influence is not the determining influence. Inasmuch as the changes and development of society proceed at an incomparably faster rate than the changes and development of geographical environment. In the space of 3,000 years, three different social systems have been successfully superseded in Europe. The primitive communal system, the slave system, and the feudal system. In the eastern part of Europe, in the USSR, even four social systems have been superseded. Yet during this period, geographical conditions in Europe have either not changed at all or have changed so slightly that geography takes no note of them. And that is quite natural. Changes in geographical environment of any importance require millions of years, whereas a few hundred or a couple of thousands of years are enough for an even very important changes in the system of human society. It follows from this that geographical environment cannot be the chief cause, the determining cause, of social development, for that which remains almost unchanged in the course of tens, thousand, tens of thousands of years cannot be the chief cause of development of that which undergoes fundamental changes in the course of a few hundred years. Further, there can be no doubt that the concept conditions of material life of society also includes growth of population, density of population of one degree or another, for people are an essential element of the conditions of material life of society, and without a definite minimum number of people, there can be no material life of society. Is growth of population the chief force that determines the character of the social system of man? Or isn't it? Of course, growth of population does influence the development of society, does facilitate or retard the development of society, but it cannot be the chief force of development of society. And its influence on the development of society cannot be the determining influence because, by itself, growth of population does not furnish the clue to the question why a given social system is replaced precisely by such and such a new system and not by another, why the primitive communal system is su succeeded precisely by the slave system, the slave system by the feudal system, and the feudal system by the bourgeois system, and not by some other. If growth of population were the determining force of social development, then a higher density of population would be bound to give rise to a corresponding, correspondingly higher type of social system. But we do not find that to be the case. The density of population in China is four times as great in the USA. Yet the USA stands higher than China in the scale of social development. For China, in China, a semi-feudal system still prevails, whereas the USA has long ago reached the highest stage of development of capitalism. The density of population in Belgium is nine times as great as the U.S. and 20, 19 times and 26 times as great as the USSR. Yet the USSR, yet the USA stands higher than Belgium in the scale of social development. And as for the USSR, Belgium lags a whole historical epoch behind this country. For in Belgium, the capitalist system prevails, whereas the USSR has already done away with capitalism and has set up a socialist system. It follows from this that growth of population is not, and cannot be, the chief force of development of society, the force which determines the character of the social system, the physio... 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 I say it again? Physiognomy. The physiognomy of society. A. What is the chief determinant force? What then is the chief force in the complex of conditions in the complex of conditions of material life of society, which determines the physiognomy of society, the character of the social system, the development of society from one system to another? This force, historical materialism holds, is the method of procuring the means of life necessary for human existence 
the mode of production of material values, food, clothing, footwear, uh, houses, fuel, instruments of production, etc., uh, which are indispensable for the life and development of society. In order to live, people must have food, clothing, shelter, fuel, etc. In order to have these material values, people must produce them. And in order to produce them, people must have the instruments of production with which food, clothing, footwear, shelter, fuel, etc. are produced. They must be able to produce these instruments and to use them. The instruments of production wherewith material values are produced, the people who operate the instruments of production and carry on the production of material values, thanks to a certain production experience and labor skill, all these elements jointly constitute the productive forces of society. But the productive forces are only one aspect of production, only one aspect of the mode of production, an aspect that expresses the relation to men, to the objects, and forces of nature which they make use of for the production of material values. Another aspect of production, another aspect of the mode of production, is the relation of men to each other in the process of production, men's relation of production. Men carry on a struggle against nature and utilize nature for the production of material values, not in isolation from each other, not as separate individuals, but in common, in groups, in societies. Production, therefore, is at all times and under all conditions social production. In the production of material values, men enter into mutual relations of one kind with, uh, in one kind or another within production, into relations of production of one kind or another. Uh, these may be relations of cooperation and mutual help between people who are free from exploitation. They may be relations of domination and subordination. And lastly, they may be transitional from one form of relation of production to another. But whatever, the, but whatever the character of the relations of production may be, always and in every system, they constitute just as essential and an element of production as the productive forces in society. In production, Marx says, men not only act on nature, but also on one another. They produce only by cooperating, uh, cooperating in a certain way and mutually exchanging their activities. In order, to in order to produce, they enter into definite connections and relations with one another, and only within these social connections and relations does their action on nature, does production take place. Consequently, production, the mode of production, embraces both the productive forces of society and men's relations of production and is thus the embodiment of their unity in the process of production of material values. We'll pause here. B. Exactly. Marx found space for social science to grow and become relevant. No one talks about it. It's wild. It's truly wild. Yeah. Like, they're like so desperate to hide this from people that it hurts us all. It hurts the development of the world. It's like, wow, right? Next up, B. The first feature of production. The first feature of production is that it never stays at one point for a long time and is always in a state of change and development. And that, furthermore, changes in the mode of production inevit inevitably call forth changes in the whole social system, social ideas, political views, and political institutions. They call forth a reconstruction of the whole social and political order. At different stages of, the, of development, people make use of different modes of production, or, to put it more crudely, lead different manners of life. In the primitive commune, there is no one mode of production. Under slavery, there is another mode. There is one mode of production. Under slavery, another mode. Under feudalism, a third, and so on. 
and correspondingly, men's social system, the spiritual life of men, their views and political institutions also vary. Whatever is the mode of production of a society, such in the main is the society itself, its ideas and theories, its political views and institutions. Or to put it more crudely, whatever is man's manner of life, such is his manner of thought. This means that the history of development of society is above all the history of the development of production, the history of the modes of production which succeed each other in the course of centuries, the history of the development of productive forces and of people's relations of production. Hence, the history of social development is at the same time the history of the producers of material values themselves, the history of the laboring masses, who are the chief force in the process of production and who carry on the production of material values necessary for the existence of society. Hence, if historical science is to be real science, it can no longer reduce the history of social development to the actions of kings and generals, to the actions of conquerors and subjugators of states, but must above all devote itself to the history of the producers of material values, the history of the laboring masses, the history of peoples. Hence, the clue to study the uh, to, the clue to the study of the laws of history of society must not be sought in men's minds, in the views and ideas of society, but in the mode of production practiced by society in any given historical period. It must be sought in the economic life of society. Hence, the prime task of historical science is to study and disclose the laws of production, the laws of development of the productive forces, and of the relations of production, the laws of economic development of society. Hence, if the party of the proletariat is to be a real party, it must above all acquire a knowledge of the laws of development of production, of the laws of economic development of society. Hence, if it is not to err in policy, the party of the, prolet of the proletariat must both in drafting its program and in its practical activities proceed primarily from the laws of development of production, from the laws of economic development of society. i take a little pause here, and we're going to continue from this part. The second feature of production, C. The second feature of production is that it ch its changes and development always begin with changes and development of the productive forces, and in the first place, with changes and development of the instruments of production. <clears throat> productive forces are therefore the most mobile and revolutionary element of productions. First, the productive forces of society change and develop, and develop, and then, depending on these changes, and in conformity with them, men's relations of production their economic relations change. This does not, however, uh, however, does not mean that the relations of production do not influence the development of, pro of the productive forces and that the latter are not dependent on the former. While their development is dependent on the development of the productive forces, the relations of production in their turn react upon the development of the productive forces accelerating or retarding it. In this connection, it should be noted that the relations of production cannot for too long a time lag behind and be in a state of contradiction to the growth of the productive forces, inasmuch as the productive forces can develop in full measure only when the relations of production correspond to the character, the state of the productive forces, and allow, the, for, uh, and allow full scope for their development. Therefore, however, much of the relations of production may lag behind the development of the productive forces. They must, sooner or later, come into correspondence with, and actually do come into correspondence with, the level of development of the productive forces, the character of the productive forces. Otherwise, we would have a fundamental violation of the unity of the productive forces 
and the relations of production within the system of production, a disruption of production as a whole, a crisis of production, a destruction of productive forces. An instance in which the relations of production do not correspond to the character of the productive forces, conflict with them, is the economic crises in capitalist countries where private capitalist ownership of the means of production is in glaring incongruity with the social character of the process of production, with the character of the productive forces. This results in economic crises, which lead to the destruction of productive forces. Furthermore, this incongruity itself constitutes the economic basis of social revolution, the purpose of which is to destroy the existing social the existing relations of production and to create new relations of production corresponding to the character of the productive forces. In contrast, an instance in which the relations of production completely correspond to the character of the productive forces is the socialist national economy of the USSR, where the social ownership of the means of production fully corresponds to the social character of the process of production, and where, before, uh, because of this, economic crises and the destruction of productive forces are unknown. Consequently, the productive forces are not only the most mobile and revolutionary element in production, but are also determining are also the determining element in the development of production. Whatever are the productive forces, such must be the relations of production. While the state of the, of the productive forces furnishes the answer to the question, with what instruments of production do men produce the material values they need, the state of the relations of production furnishes the answer to, the, to another question, who owns the means of production, the land, forests, waters, mineral resources, raw materials, instruments of production, production premises, means of transportation and communication, etc.? Who commands the means of production, whether the whole of society or individual persons, groups, or classes, which utilize them for the exploitation of other groups, persons, or classes? Here is a rough picture of the development of productive forces from ancient times to our day. The transition from crude stone tools to the bow and arrow, and the accompanying transition from the life of hunters to the domestication of animals and primitive pastures. The transition from stone tools to metal tools, the iron axe, the wooden plow fitted with an iron coulter, etc., with a corresponding transition to tillage and agriculture, a further improvement in metal tools for the working up of materials, the introduction of blacksmith's bellows, the introduction of pottery, with a corresponding development of handicrafts, the separation of handicrafts from agriculture, the development of an independent handicraft industry, and subsequently of manufacture, the transition from handicraft tools to machines, and the transformation of handicraft and manufacture into machine industry, the transition to the machine system and the rise of modern large-scale machine industry, such as a general and far from complete picture of the development of the productive forces of society in the course of man's history. It will be clear that the development and improvement of the instruments of production was affected by men who were related to production, and not independently of men, and consequently the change and development of the instruments of production was accompanied by a change and development of men, as the most important element of the productive forces, by a change and development of their production experience, their labor skill, their ability to handle the instruments of production. In conformity with the change and development of the productive forces of society in the course of history, men's relations of production, their economic relations also changed and developed. Main Types of Relations of Production Five main types of relations of production are known to history. Primitive, communal, slave, feudal, capitalist, and socialist. The basis, of the, social, the basis of the relations of production under the primitive communal system is that the means of production are socially owned. This 
in the main corresponds to the character of the productive forces of that period. Stone tools, and later the bow and arrow, precluded the possibility of men individually combating the forces of nature and beasts of prey. In order to gather the fruits of the forest, to catch fish, to build some sort of habitation, men were obliged to work in common if they did not want to die of starvation or fall victim to beasts of prey to or to neighboring societies. Labor in common led to the common ownership of the means of production, as well as of the fruits of production. Here, the conception of private ownership of the means of production did not yet exist, except for the personal ownership of certain implements of production, which were, at the same time, means of defense against beasts of prey. Here, there was no exploitation, no classes. The basis of the relations of production under the slave system is that the slave owner owns the means of production. He also owns the worker in production, the slave whom he can sell, purchase, or kill as though he were an animal. Such relations of production in the main correspond to the state of the production forces of that period. Instead of stone tools, men now have metal tools at their command. Instead of the wretched and primitive husbandry of the hunter, who knew neither pasturage nor tillage, there now appear pasturage, tillage, handicrafts, and a division of labor between these branches of production. There appears the possibility of the exchange of products between individuals and between societies, of the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, the actual accumulation of the means of production in the hands of a minority, and the possibility of subjugation of the majority by a minority and the conver a conversion of the majority into slaves. Here, we no longer find the common and free labor of all members of society in the production process. Here, there prevails the forced labor of slaves, who are exploited by the non-laboring slave owners. Here, therefore, there is no common ownership of the means of production or of the fruits of production. It is... It is replaced by private ownership. Here, the slave owner appears as the prime and principal property owner in the full sense of the term. Rich and poor, exploiters and exploited, people with full rights and people with no rights, and a fierce struggle, a class struggle between them. Such is the picture of the slave system. The basis of the relations of production under the feudal system is that the feudal lord owns the means of production and does not fully own the worker in production, the serf, whom the feudal lord can no longer kill, but whom he can buy and sell. Alongside of feudal ownership, there exists individual ownership by the peasant and the handicraftsman of his implements of production and his private enterprise based on his personal labor. Such relations of production in the main correspond to the state of the productive forces of that period. Further improvements in the smelting and working of iron, the spread of the iron plow and the loom, the further development of agriculture, horticulture, viniculture, and dairying, the appearance of manufactories, uh, manu manufactories alongside the handicraft workshops. Such are the characteristic features of the state of the productive forces. Or was I? I don't know. The new productive forces demand that the laborer shall display some kind of initiative in production and an inclination for work, an interest in work. The feudal lord therefore discards the slave as a laborer who has no interest in work and is entirely without initiative and prefers to deal with the serf who has his own husbandry implements of production and a certain interest in work essential for the cultivation of the land and for the payment in kind of a part of his harvest to the feudal lord. Here, private ownership is further developed. Exploitation is nearly as severe as it was under slavery. It is only slightly mitigated. A class struggle between exploiters and exploited is the principal feature of the feudal system. The basis of the relations of production under the capitalist system 
is that the capitalist owns the means of production, but not the workers in production, the wage laborers, whom the capitalist can neither kill nor sell, because they are personally free, but who are deprived of means of production, and in order not to die of hunger, are obliged to sell their labor power to the capitalist and to bear the yoke of exploitation. Alongside of capitalist property, in the means of production, we find, at first on a wide scale, private property of the peasants and handicraftsmen in the means of production. These peasants and handicraftsmen no longer being serfs and their private property being based on personal, on personal labor. In place of the handicraft workshops and manufactories, there appear huge mills and factories equipped with machinery. In place of the manorial estates tilled by the primitive implements of production of the peasant, now there appear large capitalist farms run on scientific lines and supplied with agricultural machinery. The new productive forces require that the workers in production shall be better educated and more intelligent than the downtrodden and ignorant serfs, that they be able to understand machinery and operate it properly. Therefore, the capitalists prefer to deal with wage workers who are free from the bonds of serfdom and who are educated enough to be able properly to operate machinery. But having developed productive forces to a tremendous extent, capitalism has become enmeshed in contradictions which it is unable to solve. By producing larger and larger quantities of commodities and reducing their prices, capitalism intensifies competition, ruins the mass of small and medium private owners, converts them into proletarians, and reduces their pur purchasing power, with the result that it becomes impossible to dispose of the commodities produced. On the other hand, by expanding production and concentrating millions of workers in huge mills and factories, capitalism lends the process of production a social character and thus undermines its own foundation, inasmuch as the social character of the process of production demands the social ownership of the means of production. Yet the means of production remain private capitalist property, which is incompatible with the social character of the, so of the process of production. These why can't I say the word? Irreconcilable. Wow. These irreconcilable contradictions between the character of the productive forces well, well, and the relations of production makes themselves felt in periodic, periodic uh, periodical crisis of overproduction. When the capitalists, finding no effective demand for their goods owing to the ruin of the mass of the population which they themselves have brought about, are compelled to burn products, destroy manufactured goods, suspend production, and destroy productive forces at a time when millions of people are forced to suffer unemployment and starvation. Not because there are not enough goods, but because there is an uh, overproduction of goods. This means that the capitalist relations of production have ceased to correspond to the state of productive forces of society and have come into irre irreconcilable contradiction with them. This means that capitalism is pregnant with revolution, whose mission it is to replace the existing capitalist ownership of the means of production by socialist ownership. This means that the main feature of the capitalist system is a most acute class struggle between the exploiters and the exploited. The basis of the relations of production under the socialist system, which so far has been established only in the USSR, is the social ownership of the means of production. Here there are no longer exploiters and exploited. The goods produced are distributed according to labor performed, on the principle, he who does not work, neither shall he eat. Here the mutual relations of people in the process of production are marked by comradely cooperation and the socialist mutual assistance of workers who are free from exploitation. Here are the relations of production fully here the relations of production fully correspond to the state of productive forces, for the social character of the process of production is reinforced by the social ownership of the means of production. For this reason, socialist production in the USSR 
knows no periodical crises of overproduction and their accompanying absurdities. For this reason, the productive forces here develop at an accelerated pace, for the, rela for the relations of production that correspond to them offer full scope for such development. Such is the picture of the development of men's relations of production in the course of human history. Such is the dependence of the development of the relations of production on the development of the productive forces of society, and primarily on the development of the instruments of production, the dependence by virtue of which the changes and development of the productive forces sooner or later lead to corresponding changes and development of the relations of production. The use and fabrication of instruments of labor, says Marx, although existing in the germ among a certain species of animals, is specifically characteristic of the human labor process. And Franklin therefore defines man as a tool-making animal. Relics of bygone instruments of labor possess the same importance for the investigation of ex extinct economical forms of society as do fossil bones for the determination of extinct species of animals. It is not the articles made, but how they are made, that enables us to distinguish between economical epochs. Instruments of labor not only supply a standard of the degree of development to which human labor has attained, but they are also indicators of the social conditions under which that labor is carried on. And further, social relations are closely bound up with productive forces. In acquiring new productive forces, men change their mode of production, and in changing their mode of production, in changing the way of, le of earning their living, they change all their social relations. The hand mill gives you society with the feudal lord, the steam mill society with the industrial capitalist. There is a continual movement of growth in productive forces, of destruction in social relations, of formation in ideas. The only immutable thing is the abstraction of movement. Speaking of historical materialism as formulated in the Communist Manifesto, Engels says, Economic production and the structure of society of every historical epoch necessarily arising therefrom constitute the foundation for the political and intellectual history of that epoch. Consequently, ever since the dissolution of the primeval communal ownership of land, all history has been a history of class struggles, of struggles between exploited and exploiting, between dominated and dominating classes at various stages of social development. This struggle, however, has now reached a stage where the exploited and ex ex oppressed classes, the proletariat, can no longer emancipate itself from the class which exploits and oppresses it, the bourgeoisie, without at the same time forever freeing the whole of society from exploitation, oppression, and class struggles. And D. The third feature of production. The third feature of production is that the rise of new productive forces and of the relations of production corresponding to them does not take place separately from the old system after the disappearance of the old system, but within the new system. It takes place not as a result of the deliberate and conscious activity of man, but spontaneously, unconsciously, independently of the will of man it takes place spontaneously and independently of the will of man for two reasons. Firstly, because man, men are not free to choose one mode of production or another, because as every new generation enters life, it finds productive forces and relations of production already existing as the result of the work of former generations, owing to which it is obliged at first to accept and adapt itself to everything it finds ready-made in the sphere of production in order to be able to produce material values. Secondly, because when improving one instrument of production or another, one clement of the production forces or another, men do not realize, do not understand or stop to reflect what social results these improvements will lead to, but only think of their everyday interests, of lightening their labor and of securing some, and of securing some direct and tangible advantage for themselves. 
When gradually and gropingly, certain members of primitive communal society passed from the use of stone tools to the use of iron tools, they, of course, did not know and did not stop to reflect what social re results this innovation would lead to. They did not understand or realize that the change to metal tools meant a revolution in production, that it would, in the long term, lead to the slave system. They simply wanted to lighten their labor and secure an immediate and tangible advantage. Their conscious activity was confined within the narrow bounds of this everyday personal interest. When, in the period of the feudal system, the young bourgeoisie of Europe be began to erect, alongside of the small guild workshops, large manufactories, and thus advanced the productive forces of society, it of course did not know and did not stop to reflect what social consequences this innovation would lead to. It did not realize or understand that this small innovation would lead to a regrouping of social forces, which was to end in a revolution both against the power of kings, whose favors it so highly valued, and against the nobility, to whose ranks it foremost representatives not infrequently aspired. It simply wanted to lower the cost of producing goods, to throw larger quantities of goods on the markets of Asia and of recently discovered America, and to make bigger profits. Its conscious activity was confined within the narrow bounds of this commonplace practical aim. When the Russian capitalists, in conjunction with foreign capitalists, energetically implanted modern large-scale machinery industry in Russia, while leaving Tsardom intact, and turning the peasants over to the tender mercies of the landlords. They, of course, did not know and did not stop to reflect what social consequences this extensive growth of productive forces would lead to. They did not realize or understand that this big leap in the realm of productive forces of society would lead to a regrouping of social forces that would enable the proletariat to effect a union with the peasantry and to bring about a victorious socialist revolution. They simply wanted to expand industrial production to the limit, to gain control of the huge home market, to become monopolists, and to squeeze as much profit as possible out of the national economy. Their conscious activity did not extend beyond their commonplace, strictly practical interests. Accordingly, Marx says, in the social production of their life, that is, in the production of the material values necessary to the life of men, men enter into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of their will, relations of production which correspond to a definite stage of development of the material productive forces. This, however, does not mean that changes in the relations of production and the transition from old relations of production to new relations of production proceed smoothly, without conflicts, without upheavals. On the contrary, such a transition usually takes place by the means of the revolutionary overthrow of the old relations of production and the establishment of new relations of production. Up to a certain, up to a certain period, the development of the productive forces and the changes in the realm of the relations of production proceed spontaneously, independently of the will of men. But that is so only open, uh, but that is so only up to a certain moment until the new and developing productive forces have reached a proper state of maturity. After the new productive forces have matured, the existing relations of production and their upholders, the ruling classes, become that in, insuperable obstacle, which can only be removed by the conscious action of the new classes, by the forcible acts of these classes, by revolution. Here there stands out in bold relief the tremendous role of the new social ideas, of new political institutions, of a new political power, whose mission it is to absolve by force the old relations of production. Out of the conflict between the new productive forces and the old relations of production, out of the new economic demands of society, there arise new social ideas. The new social ideas organize and mobilize the masses the masses become welded into a new political army, uh, create a new revolutionary power, and make use of it to abolish by force the old system of relations of production, and to, firm and to firmly establish the new system. A spontaneous process of development yields place uh, to the conscious actions of men, peaceful development to 
violent upheaval. Evolution to revolution. Proletariat, says Marx, during its contest with the bourgeoisie, is compelled by the force of circumstances to organize itself as a class. By means of a revolution, it makes itself the ruling class, and as much, sweeps away by force the old contradictions of production. And further, the proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degrees, all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, that is, of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to or increase the total of productive forces as rapidly as possible. Force is the midwife of every old society, pregnant with a new one. Here is the formulation, a formulation of genius, of the essence of historical materialism given by Marx in 1859 in his historic preface to his famous book, A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy. In the social production of their life, men enter into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of their will, relations of productions which correspond to a definite stage of development of their material productive forces. The sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation, on which rises a legal and political superstructure uh, and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions, the social, political, and intellectual life process in general. It is not the consciousness of men that determines uh, their being. Lost in this one. It's not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. At a certain stage of their development, the material productive forces of, of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production, or what is but a legal expression for the same thing, with the property relations within which they have been at work hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters. Then begins an epoch of social revolution. With the change of the economic foundation, the entire immense superstructure is more or less rapidly transformed. In considering such transformations, a distinction should always be made between the material transformation of the economic conditions of production, which can be, ter which can be determined with the precision of natural science, and the legal, political, religious, aesthetic, or philosophic, in short, ideological forms in which men become conscious of this conflict and fight it out. Just as our opinion of an individual is not based on what he thinks of himself, so can we not judge of such a period of transformation by its own consciousness? On the contrary, this consciousness must be explained rather from the contradictions of material life, from the existing conflict between the social productive forces and the relations of production. No social order ever perishes before all the productive forces for which there is room in it have developed and new, higher relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society itself. Therefore, mankind always sets itself only such tasks as it can solve, since looking at the matter more closely, it will always be found that the task itself arises only when the material conditions for its solution already exist or are at the least in the process of formation. Such is the Marxist materialism as applied to social life, to the history of society. Such are the principles of dialectical and historical materialism. Goodbye.